Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about uh, the challenges we faced in trying to apply our research on using machine learning to automate the database optimization and tuning um, at Carnegie Mellon University, and then we've since spun it off as a startup as AutoTune. So I wanna just talk about the things we've, we've had to learn of how do you actually make all the machine learning we developed at the university, make it actually work in the real world. And the, the spoiler is gonna be that machine learning isn't this magic wand that you just wave it at any, any hard problem in a database and makes it tractable. There's a bunch of things we're gonna to have to do to make this all work. And it, a lot is gonna be dealing with just how humans are using databases and how they're set up in real application stacks. So normally I would jump right in and talk about the material, but for this uh, talk, I'm gonna actually start off giving a demo of AutoTune. We're gonna kick it off, let it run while I give the talk, and at the end we'll go check to see how it, how it did. Uh, so for this, we're running the standard TPCC benchmark that everyone does uh, to evaluate the performance of, of transactional databases. We're gonna be running on Postgres and running on Amazon RDS, and we're gonna start off with the default configuration that Amazon gives you when you deploy an RDS, um, and we're gonna let AutoTune automatically uh, fix things. So. Uh -huh. and of course, this got slight flip over. So, sorry. I had to set up beforehand. Sorry. All right, so this is the AutoTune uh, website and the service. So we've already done the hard stuff of, of, of connecting AutoTune to the, uh, to the instance. So all we're going to do here is go under tuning options uh, and we're enable auto-tuning. Just let AutoTune do whatever, you know, apply the changes automatically and it's gonna learn that it's, it's making things go better over time. Um, and so this is running in the background, running TPCC, and we can see that our current performance latency is, uh, what, P99 is, is in the low milliseconds, but our throughput is roughly 1,000 transactions, 1,200 transactions a second. So again, we'll let that run, and we'll come back to it later on. All right, so for the rest of this talk, I wanna talk about the background of like what people looked at have, have applying machine learning to, to automatic database tuning. Then we'll talk about the challenges we face in applying state-of-the-art methods to uh, to the real one, real world databases, and why the, you know, the hardest problem nece isn't necessarily what machine learning algorithm they're using, but actually how to, again, interact with the database system. And then we'll talk about the things that we had to fix to make AutoTune work in the real world, and then I'll finish off talking about what I think are some opening problems that are worth investigating, both, again, on the research side and in industry. All right, so the background. Uh, automated database tuning is an old problem. Uh, you know, ever since people built the first relational databases back in the 1970s, they realized that, oh, someone's gonna have to decide what's the optimal query plan for a SQL statement or, or Quell if you're back in the day, and what's the optimal way to physically organize data uh, on disk and in memory. And so the, you know, obviously humans have been doing this for a long time, but they recognized early on that it'd be nice if we could have computers do this for us. And so at a high level, the ideas are the same of using computers to op optimize database systems. It's just they maybe called it slightly different things and they've used slightly different techniques than we're using today. So way back in the 1970s, one of the first papers on doing automatic index tuning uh, came out in 1976. And again, instead of calling this machine learning or, 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 or uh, self-driving databases, they called it self-adaptive databases. And this paper here is actually written by one of my Peachy advisors, Peachy advisor uh, in 1976, and he's dead. Uh, so this is an old problem people have been trying to solve for a long time. In the 1990s and 2000s, uh, the, this is where we saw the, the enterprise or the database vendors get, get involved in investigating the space. And so this is a paper in 2007 from Microsoft Research on looking at a 10-year history of all the great things they did in, in auto admin, um, doing index tuning, uh, uh, query tuning, uh, partitioning keys, and so forth. And so Microsoft had their own set of tools, but both Oracle and DB2 or IBM had, had similar tools. Teradata had something else as well. But the key thing about this work done uh, in, in the 2000s is that these are all recommendation tools for DBAs. I mean, you put, you put a bunch of data or information about your database, you run these tools, and they would spit back, here's the recommendations we think you should do. And then the human had to decide whether they were correct or not, and you know, click a button to apply them to, to the database system. So the era we're in now, uh, which is I coined as the self-driving database era, the 2010s, 2020s, where this is now we're looking at to remove the human entirely and not require a human to decide, yes, this is what I want to do. We want to have a sort of automated method of, of taking the recommendations, determining when to apply them and how to apply them, and then learning from those experiences, learning from the changes we make, how they help or hurt the database system. So I thought I was clever because I came up with the term, I had a paper in 2017 describing these as self-driving database systems because I was at Carnegie Mellon. That's where a lot of the early uh, work on self-driving cars was developed, 
And then Oracle came out with their own thing in 2017. So they had the first, world's first self-driving database, um, which is fine, because that's what Oracle does. But the key difference, though, about this era versus what was done before is now we're actually going to use machine learning artificial intelligence, where we're actually going to have uh, the tools learn from the experiences, as I said, and make better recommendations going forward, or learning from other databases to make other new databases work better. Whereas the previous work was using what I'll call traditional search optimization techniques, like branch and bound search, greedy search, uh, simulated annealing, heuristics, right? This is now we're applying modern machine learning techniques to uh, figure these things out. So this is just an overview of what I think was some more interesting uh, work done in the space of doing automated database tuning. Uh, so for indexes, there's a lot of work done, actually in, in mostly in, in the enterprise world, uh, for SQL Server and Azure and Oracle. Um, there's, there's tools that can pick partitioning keys or sharding keys. But for knob configurations, like picking the, the parameters, how to tune them. And then for query optimization, how to pick the right join order or you know, how to pick what plan hits provide to the database system. So at a high level, all these tools work the same way. You have some database that you want to optimize. There's an application that connects to it, runs SQL queries, or it exercises the actual system. And then you connect your tuning algorithm or tuning tool to the database to observe the behavior of the system while it's running these queries. So this could be collecting, depending on what you're trying to optimize, could be uh, collecting query plans, could be collecting uh, uh, telemetry, like, like OS metrics, internal metrics from, from the database system itself. And then you use this data to train, uh, you, in a, you put this data in a repository of all the other data you've seen for this database system, and then you train machine learning models that can try to predict the behavior of the system as you start making changes to whatever you're trying to optimize for. Right, so you would tell the system ahead of time, I want to optimize uh, my, my P99 latency, or I want to reduce C utilization, reduce my cost. And then you would have some, your tuning algorithm rely on these models to figure out how to optimize uh, for that objective function. And then the algorithm makes recommendations or makes changes to the database system, and then there's this feedback loop where it observes the effect of that change and refines the models and eventually converges to an optimal solution. So for this talk, I want to focus on knob configuration because this is what AutoTune originally started off looking into. Um, and also I think this is a really challenging problem and is actually perfect for machine learning because the, the set of knobs you have from one Postgres instance or one MySQL instance to another one is almost always going to be the same. We can ignore like query session knobs or table level knobs, but the global knobs are always going to be the same. Um, so you can use the priors from other systems applied to another one. And just give you an idea of how challenging the problem is, if you just look at the last 20 year history of all the releases of MySQL and Postgres, and just counted the number of knobs that they've added over the years, you can see that MySQL grew by 7x and Postgres grew by 5x. Now, not all of these knobs will affect performance, right? They're file names, directory paths, things you don't want machine learning to actually touch. But there's enough of them that will it actually it could, could, it will make a difference. Um, and again, this is not even including table level knobs. Like in Postgres, you can set the fill factor on a per table basis. Right? That's not even counting all of these. So uh, AutoTune was, is a, or is a automated database tuning uh, optimization service, again, that we spun out at, of, of Carnegie Mellon uh, with my students. Basically what happened was we were doing an academic project, a bunch of people emailed us and said, we have this exact problem, we'll give you money to fly a student out, set it up for us. And this happened so many times we decided, we, think, we realized that there was a startup idea here. So the current version of AutoTune supports only Amazon RDS and Aurora databases, both regular or sort of provision instances and serverless instances. And we only support MySQL and, and Postgres. All right, there's nothing fundamental to the machine learning algorithms that limit us from other, supporting other database systems or on-prem and other environments. It's just from a sort of engineering standpoint, it makes our life easier dealing with only two databases and dealing with a standardized environment like AWS. So we're going to use machine learning to automatically optimize configurations of database systems. And in the academic version, we only supported knobs. Since we've, we've spun out of the university, uh, we've, we've supported knobs, indexes, query tuning, and other cloud configuration. Basically, the thing we realize is we can tune the knobs all you want, but if you have a query that's doing a sequential scan on a petabyte of data, there's no knob we can touch to make that run faster. You need indexes. So we've, we've had support for these other things. So the way AutoTune works at Hilo is like that, the diagram I showed before. You have your database you want to optimize. You install this little agent in your, in your network that has permissions to connect to, to the database and retrieve the you know, internal telemetry that, that the data system generates. So InnoDB statistics or any PG statistics from Postgres. And then the agent also connects to Amazon and goes and collects OS telemetry, like pages read, pages written, CPU utilization, memory usage, and so forth. 
And then it ships that down to our service, to our tuning API, where we store that in a repository with all the other training data we've collected from other databases. And we use that to train models on the, the expected behavior of the system as we start making changes. And then a recommendation algorithm, algorithm or a recommendation engine will then spit out, here's the actions I think you should apply to optimize your system. And so you can either have AutoTrain apply these configurations automatically for you, uh, but in some cases, people don't trust the machine learning uh, models just yet. So we can also prompt you to say, here's, here's a recommendation to a human who then decide, yes, I approve of this change. And then they can either apply it themselves or let AutoTune apply it for you. So this sounds amazing. And I, I admit, the, when you look at not just our research papers, the other people that are working in this space as well, the, the performance improvements you're getting for these machine learning models is amazing. Right, we're talking like 3x, 10x, 4x improvements over stock configurations. Um, but there's the key challenge, though, is there's a bunch of assumptions that people make in these research papers about how people can use machine learning-based tools in the real world that actually don't, don't uh, come to fruition and aren't, aren't correct at all. And I fully admit that I'm hypocritical of this, that the papers we've written follow along at these same assumptions. And then when we went in the real world, they, you know, it turned out to be completely wrong. And there's a bunch of stuff we had to do to make our machine learning models work uh, correctly and, and safely. And so what I'm going to talk about now is all some of the sort of, I'm going to talk about three key challenges that we faced uh, and why this is problematic when you're trying to use a machine learning based tool to optimize your system. And then we'll finish up and talk about what we had to do to, to fix things. All right, so the first challenge you're going to face is that people don't maintain suitable staging databases in their environments. Right, so a typical setup is sort of like this. You have your production database, and you have a staging database. The production database is the only thing that talks to the application. The application sends SQL queries there, right? And you want that to be fast as possible because uh, this is what the, your end users or customers are, are, are interacting with. And then the staging database is typically where your developers are trying out new versions of the application, applying schema migrations, testing things out before they go ahead and push it into production. So in all the academic literature, but actually from industry and from, uh, from, from academia, uh, they assume that you're gonna put the tuning tool and attach it to the staging database, and then train all your models on what the activity of the staging database, and then you apply the recommendations that you generate based on the, the training data from the staging database, you're gonna go ahead and apply it to the production database. Right? And this doesn't work, right? Because the, the environment is completely different. So the production database almost always is gonna be a the, you know, a more expensive machine or more expensive instance than what the staging database is, right? We've talked to customers who are spending $40,000 a month on some Postgres database, you know, with replicas and provision IOPS on Amazon, and there's no way they're gonna spend $40,000 a month just for a staging database to run, for the developers to run experiments, right? It's always running on a smaller instance size, always running with less memory and less CPU. And so now the challenge is if you train your machine learning models based on what you think the, you know, the data looks like from the staging database, then when you apply recommendations, it's not gonna, they don't always work out correctly. We had one customer where they were running on Aurora and we trained our models on the staging database and we were trying to optimize Postgres and they wanted to reduce the IOPS costs so we, we, we were tuning the auto vacuum and we reduced their cost by 15%. For amount, for amount they were paying a month, that was a lot. But when we applied those same recommendations to the, to the production database, we only saw a 1% improvement. And this is because, again, the models were trained on data that doesn't match or doesn't match the, the environment that the real production database is deployed on. Other challenges come up when you deal with serverless databases or things with dynamic scaling. So serverless databases, the problem is cold start. Right? If, if you, the first set of queries you may hit on, will be, on in the database will be slow because it's paging in things from disk into the buffer pool. And so the machine learning models may think it's actually doing the wrong thing because it's running slow for the first set of queries when in actuality it's the right thing, but the, the, the hardware hasn't sort of got warmed up yet. So you have to deal with that. This is, the dynamic scaling problem is less of an issue on the newer versions of RDS. Like with GP, GP3, you, you get sort of guaranteed IOPS. In GP2, they had this notion of burst credits. So you would get like rollover minutes on your cell phone. You would get additional credits for, if you had a sort of spike in, in traffic, you would Pay, you, you, you would get an improved performance using those credits. But once you exhausted all those credits, then you got throttled back to some baseline performance. So again, from a machine learning model's perspective, this is bad because now the environment is inconsistent, where I think I'm running really fast, I'm doing the right thing, but then all of a sudden I get throttled back because Amazon, uh, Amazon turns down my IOPS, um, and now, that's, you know, now I may think I'm doing the, the, you know, the wrong thing when it's really the right thing. 
All right, so, an even, so basically, again, performance variability is bad, not only for humans, but also for machine learning models. All right, so say you even had the, the same staging Davis environment. The next challenge we face is that people cannot capture workloads and do replays on the staging database to make, it, make the database look like the same traffic, the same behavior as the production database, right? So the standard way people, we tell people to do this is that you take a snapshot of your database and then and turn on workload capture to collect some query trace during some time you think is most important for your application, right? On Amazon, this is, for taking a snapshot is pretty easy. It's a cl single click of the button and it'll, it'll write something out to EBS. But for workload traces in Postgres MySQL, you're basically turning on like the slow query log to capture all the queries that get executed. And then you use like a replay tool to uh, rerun, rerun the trace on the snapshot on the staging database, and then again train your models on, on, on the behavior you're seeing there, right? So the reason why this doesn't work is that people just simply can't capture the traces. So when we were at the university, all the people we were talking to, they wanted to deploy Autotune, we were just sort of doing proof of comp sets or pilot deployments, they could do this. When since we got in the real world, this is not as common as, as we had anticipated. Um, and even if you can capture work with trace, the, the replay tools, at least in the open source world, are nowhere near as good as the commercial ones. Like in, in, in Oracle and SQL Server, they can do replay, uh, query trace replay much better than the open source guys. They can really make it mimic, almost down to the microsecond, the traffic you would see on a production database and replay it on the staging database. So, so this is a big challenge. So now we can't have a, you know, even if we had the staging database have the same environment, same hardware, we can't get it to actually exercise the system at the same level, All right? So now again, you're training models on things that don't look like the production database. And I would say also too, in the open source systems, the, the methods that, that are available to do query trace capture are not as good as, again, you're, you're basically using logs that are meant for debugging for humans to try to use it for machine learning stuff. Yes? So his question is, okay, if you can't do workload capture, why not use a proxy and put it in front of the database system and do capture that way? Here. Boom, there you go, excellent. Have you seen this talk before or no? Okay, yeah. So we had one customer that did this, as he's proposing, is the right way, it was Dropbox, where they were trying to determine uh, whether they were gonna have any performance regressions going from MySQL 5.7 to MySQL 8. So they put a proxy in front of the database system that mirrored all the traffic through, from the production database also to the, the, the staging database. Right? So basically, it would, the qu query would show up, it would send to the production database, and that's the response. Whatever result you got back from the production database, that went back to the, the client. You send the same query to the staging database, but you don't care about the result. So you just drop, the proxy would drop anything that would come back. Right? If you can do this, again, assuming you're running on the same hardware as, as the production database, then you can exactly mimic the real-world workload. But we've only, we've only come across one person that does this. Proxies are much more common than I anticipated in the real world. I don't have a good sense of like, what percentage of people are using proxies. Um, we've asked the RDS people and they won't tell us. Um, but we think it's, it's, it's probably about 50%. And the, in, there's MySQL proxy that can do mirroring, but the most common Postgres proxy, PG Bouncer, can't do this. Right? And RDS proxy is another common one, can't do this either. Right? So, yes? Yeah, there's a new, pro there's a new proxy, PG Cat, from the Shopify guys written in Rust. I don't think they're doing mirroring because they're meant for sharding. Oh, it's, it's, okay. So we talked to them in, in, in December. They, it didn't have it. Okay. We'll, we'll double we'll check and look at this. Um, there's Odyssey from Yandex. There's the, uh, that one doesn't do, for Postgres, that doesn't do uh, mirroring. But we'll, we'll double check PGCAT. There's a commercial one, Hemdall, I think maybe does it as well. Um, but PG Bouncer by far is the most common deployed one for Postgres. All right. So the last problem is that even if, again, you had the same, the staging environment could match the production environment, and you had a way to replay the workload, the next problem is that there are interactions with the database system that the machine learning model suddenly can't, doesn't know about, and it's, it's difficult to ask humans for advice or hints about what's going on to help guide the machine learning models in, in an appropriate way. So this is a trace of the queries uh, running on, on a MySQL database or from a real customer, and there's this three-day period here where they had a 25% spike in traffic and we were trying to optimize CPU utilization for them. So the machine learning models thought they were doing the wrong thing during this time period because it saw a spike in CPU utilization because it was executing more queries. And so you can tweak the objective function, you know, do ratios of CPUs or CPU utilization to queries executed, 
But this brings up a larger issue of there's something that happened upstream of the application where the, where the database server didn't do anything wrong. Machine learning models didn't make any changes or was trying to learn during this time period, but it ended up making the wrong decisions because of this temporary spike. So when we asked this customer, okay, what's this 25% spike in traffic? It took them a week, but they came back and said, oh yeah, somebody wrote, deployed a new feature up above in the application stack that had a bug that started executing more queries than it should have, and that's why all of a sudden there's this spike. So we trained the database system or trained our models during this time period, but when it went back to what it normally should have been, all right, it took a little while for the models to converge and go back to a correct format, or to uh, correct predictions or correct uh, recommendations. So th again, the high level issue with this one is that there may be things that are going on in the database system that are external to it that the machine learning models simply can't, can't reason about, can't know about. And in, in even humans aren't gonna know about it because they have so many different databases, the application stack has so many things going on, it's just hard to sort of figure out what's going, you know, what, what's happening. Another interesting challenge also too is that all the machine learning models are treating each database in isolation of all others. Meaning like, I point at my one database and I try to optimize just that one database system. But if you actually think about how people deploy databases in the real world, in, in larger organizations, there's actually implicit relationships between them, whether it's sharding, whether it's mirroring traffic, or uh, you know, having, uh, you know, we've already talked about staging and production. But if you can learn things, how, how to optimize sort of one database system and learn how it would affect another database system, you can, can speed up the process of, of producing better recommendations. Yes. Right, so his question is, um, in this example here, this is an application level issue. Are there other inconsistency issues where the cloud provider itself, there's like a hiccup in EBS or like, you know, EC2 has some weird thing and then all of a sudden you have a degradation or you have a noisy neighbor, like somebody starts Bitcoin mining on the same box you are and slows you down, right? Uh, how, do you, how do we actually account for that? So for that one, you basically just need to see more data. That's, that's the way to sort of deal with that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit in a second, but the, we are quite conservative in the training data we collect and how we use it in our models, where we actually want to see 24 hours of periods, and we consider that a single observation. Whereas in the academic world, we were like, okay, well, we're running you know, in a stable environment. Let's do every you know, 10 minute observations and train our models on that. In, uh, in the real world, as you said, you have to deal with those variabilities, and 24 hours seems to be enough to sort of smooth that out. We also automatically throw away weekends and holidays too, because that's always lower traffic. Because you don't want to like, train models and say, hey, it's Saturday. I'm not doing anything. Things are great, right? But your peak load is on a Monday. So, so the question is, what about what we'll call black swan events, like a Black Friday or Singles Day in China? How do we account for that? So we don't do this yet. We've, people have asked us to do this. We just haven't done it yet. If, if it's a black swan event we've never seen before, we have to be told, right? But then if it's been a year now, and we know it's going to come up you know, on this day, what we want to, we want to be able to do, we don't do yet, is, is have ability to have a like, tag configuration to be able to say, I know that this big event's gonna occur and here's my configuration that's gonna be optimized for that time period. And then after that event's over, to go back to like what my sort of stable state is. That's the way we would handle that. But again, we can't, it, it, you know, if, it's a, if it's a major holiday like a Black Friday, we know that as humans. If it's like a weird thing that we've never seen before, then the, uh, the admittedly, the 24 hour observation period is not ideal for that because it could you know, ramp up and you get, you get peak load but we are not gonna make a change to the next, next morning. So th that's a challenge. Question in the back, yes. So, so I, think, I think your question is that this is a real workload. Real workloads have these weird anomalies. How do you, how do you actually deal with them? And again, machine learning, so yeah, you can't get rid of them. Our current strategy right now is just by having longer observation periods, which kind of sucks because you know, the time it takes maybe to converge and get better results, may take longer than maybe people anticipate, but from, if you're running on production workloads, this is the right thing to do, right? So your question is, why do we, why do we have a tool that collects, connects directly to the database system, as opposed to what, sorry? Uh, so your question is, again, why do, we, why do we have an agent connect to individual database instances instead of going to a single centralized repository? You mentioned PMM, Datadog would, would be another one. We, actually, we have not seen anybody use PMM, in, in the real world for us, it's always Datadog, right? So, but it, the idea is basically the same. We currently don't do that, but that's the next step where we're going. It's like, we can point it at some repository. If they're already collecting the same thing we are, then it's less overhead at us, like, hey, here's this agent, install it. It's, again, from an engineering perspective, it was just easier to get up, the, this, up and running this way. Yes? 
Yeah, so to her point, yes. So we are going to CloudWatch or Performance Insights and getting that data from AWS directly. It's sort of the same thing. But okay, so a third party thing would be PMM or, or right? We, I think that we collect other things for like schemas that, that, that uh, PMM doesn't generate or doesn't collect. But we can take that offline whether that's true or not. Okay. But like I said, like it's, how does, we, just, we have not come across anybody running on RDS that's running PMM. It's always CloudWatch Performance Insights. Okay. All right, so here's how to make this actually work, all work nicely in the real world. So again, the main takeaway from this is what I'm about to tell you isn't machine learning, isn't, you know, like from, from like Dana did her PhD on Ottertune, like the original algorithms and the ideas. I couldn't do another PhD on the things I'm about to describe because it's, it's just, it's just engineering, it's not advanced research. But again, to make this actually work in the real world, it's the things we had to do. So the first challenge we had to face was how to interact with humans and then how to have them be comfortable in letting Ottertune do what it needs to do. So the, the first three requests we had when we, when we launched and came out of Stealth was people wanted to specify when the machine learning algorithms are allowed to make changes. So you can specify a tuning period to say, I only want the machine learning models to apply changes during, during between nine to five. Like we had one of our customers was a DBA and he's like, I'm on call nine to five, Monday through Friday. I only want Otter to make changes during that time. So now we expose a, 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 a way to schedule when you want Otter to apply changes. The next thing they also asked us for was to specify when Otter is allowed to restart the server so, so some changes could take effect. So again, same, same customer, he's like, he was European, so I go get my talk, coffee at 10 a.m. every morning. I want Otter to restart the database server at 10 a.m. so that any knobs that require restart would, would get applied during that period. So that when he came back from his coffee break, he could look and see what the database server, uh, how it was doing. So again, we can expose this information or expose this controls to, uh, to, to the human. And then last, the last one was that we also had the ability to allow a human to specify whether change is allowed to be applied. Because again, it's like the early days of self-driving cars, people don't are gonna trust the machine learning models right away. So now that you can have a human say, yes, I approve, I approve, I approve. Again, the big thing we're going for, for the reason why we had to do this is because since nobody can have a staging database, we're running directly in production databases, we had to put more guardrails up, have the algorithms be more conservative since we know we're applying changes uh, directly in production. And again, get more people comfortable with the changes that we're making, uh, we now provide in as, as much as possible uh, explanations with, with our recommendations and can also show sort of charts and graphs and say here's why, we think, here's why your database looks this way and why we recommend this particular change. The next thing we had to deal with was uh, external costs or external factors that may be part of the organization of why they configured a database a certain way that aren't readily available or apparent to a database system. So the, the classic example I like to use is we had one customer where uh, we were optimizing MySQL for them and when we looked at the InnoDB, the initial setting they had for the InnoDB's buffer pool size was 50%. Because for, in this, this audience, everyone knows, if you read the, read the manual for, for MySQL, the conventional wisdom is to set that to be 70 to 90%, 70, 80% of the available memory, available memory to the system. But so when we talked up Otter in this database, he immediately said, oh, your buffer pool size is too small, let me jack that up to 70%. But they kept rejecting that and saying, we don't want that, it has to be 50%. So then we asked them why, and it turns out in their global config file for their entire MySQL fleet, somebody had put a comment that said the NDB buffer pool size has to be 50%. So then we asked them why. Well, it turns out the guy who came up with that rule quit the company two years ago, uh, so they didn't know why, and then they found the emails that is because they were afraid of flash mob queries, of like a bunch of queries showing up all at once and MySQL running out of memory. So they artificially set it to 50%. So the machine learner model said one thing, but the humans are saying something else, so we had to have the ability for humans to specify what the bounds could actually could be because there are, there are external costs or external factors that opportunities simply, or machine learning models can't simply know about. But we, are, we already do some curation, right? We, like we've already gone through and figured out what knobs or what values could set the database system into a particular state where if you crash, you could lose data. Like the, the, you know, whether or not you do you know, F-sync on disk, you know, when you commit a transaction to the, to the write-ahead log. The machine learning models learn very quickly. If you turn off writing to disk, you run a lot faster. But because it, it doesn't, it doesn't know if you crash, you lose the last you know ten milliseconds of data. That's a big problem in your company, right? Because that's an external cost. So we've already done sort of those curations, but now we expose this uh, this capability to the human as well. 
And we've already done other things, like you, we know that if you're running on a box that has 16 gigs of RAM, you're not going to set the buffer pool size to two terabytes. We've already sort of set those bounds as well, but this is allows humans to override things further. All right, and then the last issue is a bit of a more fuzzy thing. Um, and as a scientist, I don't like things that are imprecise, but this is, again, if you're dealing with humans, we had to do this. And so the original version of Autotune was all about performance and, and you know, trying to reduce the, the, the cost of the system and run as fast as possible. And that's nice in the beginning when people first use, use the product or use the, the you know, machine learning-based tool because they'll get a big win in the beginning, but we know there's other things they should be doing over longer periods of time that they may uh, not realize and they may think, okay, this is, I've got all my benefit, let me walk away. Or there may be things that we know is the right thing to do that will actually make your database run slower or maybe cost more, but again, it's the right thing to do. Like if you have backups turned off, we should tell you to turn them on. You'd be surprised how many people have run without backups. Um, and so is that gonna make your database run faster? No, but it's the right thing to do. So the way we, we sort of handle this now is that we expose this notion of a health score, which is an amalgamation of a bunch of different factors about your database, and, ex and have that be front and center and say, this is how your database performance is doing, right? And again, now as you start making recommendations that may be run slower, that's okay, your health score will go up, and, and people are okay with that. Now, underneath the covers, the machine learning models can't operate on this because this is a synthesized number. We still try to, you know, we still optimize for CPU utilization or, or, or query P99 latency, because that's how machine learning works, but this is what the human sees, right? All right, so I'm gonna show one graph of, this is an aggregation of all the performance improvements we've gotten with Autotune in the real world. And I've split it up between MySQL and Postgres, and then within that, I divided that further between uh, RDS and Aurora. And the median improvement you see for, for Aurora is actually higher than for regular RDS. And to me, this is surprising because the way Amazon implemented Aurora is they ripped out the storage layer of both MySQL and Postgres and have their own custom, uh, you know, log-structured infrastructure. Um, so we, there's fewer nonce are actually for us to tune, but it turns out we still get, uh, on, on, we get a higher median performance improvement for these particular systems. Now at the top here, you see there's, there's some databases where we're getting 2x better uh, improvement, right? And this, this we thought, okay, well maybe these are databases that they've done zero tuning at all, and we're just coming in and taking care of low-hanging fruit. But actually, when you actually look at, at the, 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 the actual databases themselves, we see that yes, there are 40% databases where they've done zero tuning, but there's over 60% of them actually have some, done, some tuning already and we're still able to get 2x better improvement. Now down here at the bottom, you see there's, there's almost you know, zero improvement for these particular databases, and these are your staging or you know, development databases, right? Where they're not running any queries, the database is under load, so there really isn't anything for us to optimize, right? Again, so you think you have a car, if I replace the engine it came with and I bought it from the dealer with a race car engine, but I don't drive it anywhere, is it faster? Technically, no, right? So that's, that's what's going, here at the going on here at the bottom. All right, so I want to finish up, talk about uh, some open problems that I, I think are worth investigating. And some of these things we, we've dabbled with, some of these things at both at, yeah, at the university and at the startup, um, but I think these are the things we, we, you know, we still need to solve to make machine learning, uh, machine learning for databases work better. So the first thing we looked into is like, what if there's a way to synthesize a workload that behaves the same way as the, as the production workload so that people don't have to do the workload capture? Right? You can actually use the generative models that are, you've seen like stable diffusion and, and mid-journey and these other you know, dolly things that make nice, nice images. There's that sort of category of machine learning algorithms you can maybe apply to synthesize a bunch of SQL queries that exercise a database in the same way as the real workload. So now you don't need the, the workload trace anymore. You can do all your training offline with one of these synthesized databases. I would say for this one, the results are inconclusive because we just haven't had a, we haven't looked at enough real databases to see whether we, we match. TPCC or some variation of YCSB is actually oftentimes good enough. The next problem we face is like, how long it takes to actually train, get the training data we need to, 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 for our models, and if there's a way to cut that down. So we have a research project where we're looking at using Postgres to identify that as we run a workload, the, the training data we collected for our models looks a lot like the training data we collected before, so therefore we don't need to run the rest of the workload or run, rest, run the rest of the entire query. And we can do this without sacrificing uh, the accuracy or the performance of the models. So again, that's ongoing research. The, the one thing I think is super interesting, we haven't started yet, but I think would be to make machine learning work even better for, for people using databases that aren't DBAs, is to be able to identify changes that are occurring in the application source code, like in GitHub and, and GitLab, and identify how that's gonna affect the database before they actually even apply it. 
right? So like you can think of something like I look at the, you know, I see the commits or see the PRs show up and identify, oh, this is going to affect the database in this way. Is that the right thing to do? So to give one example here, this is an application we have uh, where a student of mine eight years ago put an index in that is completely useless. Uh, and it's not until we pointed Autotune at it that we realized, oh, this is, a, this is a redundant index, we don't need this. And so had Autotune been able to see this commit or this PR where someone, this guy was trying to add this index, we could have flagged that ahead of time and maybe sent a you know, comment or sent a notification say, we see you making this change, you probably don't need this, and here's why. All right, so now I couldn't give a talk about machine learning without mentioning ChatGPT. Uh, so the question also comes up is, okay, can we use something like ChatGPT or these large language models to optimize our database systems? So we tried it. So we gave ChatGPT, the, 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 the pro version, version 4, not 3, 3.5, we gave it our MySQL schema, and we gave it some basic information about the read-write workload, uh, the, that distribution, and we asked it, started asking it questions how to optimize it. Now, in the schema itself, I modified a bunch of the tables and put traps in there for things I wanted it to find out for me. Like, if I have a bunch of redundant indexes, or if I have a column called UUID value, and I set it to be a var char instead of a UUID type. Right? I, so the common things that we see in mistakes people make in schemas. So you start asking it questions about you know, its schema, uh, and it gives me sort of generic bullet paper results you would see on Stack Overflow. And so because this is my SQL, I ask it about the adaptive hash index uh, parameter, and should I tune that? And it gives me some generic information. I'm like, yeah, you probably should leave it on, but uh, you, you should really test your workload. But then it's kind of nice, it says like, it's been deprecated in the newer version of my SQL, so you try to avoid that. So then we tried to, I asked it about my, uh, my scheme itself, and at first it told me it didn't know anything about it, um, and, and then it starts hallucinating, it starts telling me tables that I don't actually have, right? <laughs> Uh, so I, I asked about my schema, I said, I don't have your schema, and I said, I gave you the schema up above, and then I started telling about orders tables and products tables that, again, looks like a generic thing that you see on Stack Overflow, but my database doesn't actually have. So then I give it again, and it actually starts giving me somewhat useful information. Right? Again, recognize that it was generated by a Django ORM, right, just based on the table names. It recognizes that it's something keeping track of, of database systems and versions and, and metadata. So it got that correct. Um, but when, again, when I ask it for very specific things, like how's, you know, what, what should I do to optimize it, it can't tell me anything specific. Um, but it is actually kind of nice, though. It, it does recall that I asked about it to be at the hash index. So after it gives me some of the boilerplate uh, information, it says, oh, oh, by the way, you asked about at the hash index before. You should go look at that again. So at this current point in time, with chat GPT, or, th or large language models, uh, like Llama from Facebook and so forth, that they're useful for answering subjective or fuzzy questions, like, hey, my database looks a certain way, and then... Yo, Andy, oh. this is Snoop Doggy Dot. Your database is optimized and ready to use... Okay, awesome, so let's go back to the demo, sorry. Um, all right, so again, we're running TPCC. Uh, so let me go refresh this page, run analysis, right? So this is just doing knob tuning. Um, so this is what we were at before, the health score was 77, uh, and we go look at 93, so we go into recommendations, um, and you can see that it, these, are, these are the recommendations that it, that it applied, and you can see all the changes that it made. Um, I don't think it has any indexes. Yeah, so it actually found out, redundant, this is that index from that student I said before, they put eight years ago that they didn't remove, and AutoTune figures out that it's unnecessary. And then if we go under performance charts, here we can see with performance, before we were doing roughly around 1,200 transactions a second, and then during the optimization, as you can see, as they apply the configurations, we were able to get up to 3,000. Again, we were able to do this without making any changes to the application code, any changes to the SQL queries themselves. This is all done just through knob configurations. Okay. So to finish up, um, the, the main takeaway again from this is that machine learning actually does work better in the real world than it did in the, in the university, but getting there, getting that full efficacy, getting that full benefit is non-trivial, and it's not machine learning uh, things you have to fix, it's getting how to interact with real databases and real humans. Um, so if you want to try out Autotune today, uh, if you go to this link here, autotune.com slash Percona, you can get a free trial and set up for your, your RDS uh, MySQL Postgres databases. Now, you may be thinking that this is a bit bait in the switch. You came in here thinking, oh, Andy's going to tell me why machine learning sucks, DBAs are never going to die, right? Like, 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 and you feel like I, I trolled you. Um, so I would say, if you have any complaints about this, I would say my inspiration for this talk comes from the patron state of databases, Larry Ellison. Um, if you've ever read his great autobiography from the 1990s, there's this little chapter in here where he talks about during the 1980s, 
he would give a bunch of talks in the early days of relational database, the, the marketplace, he would give talks by why relational databases don't work. And in actuality, he would then describe how Oracle solved all those problems, right? Uh, and it was pretty much a sales pitch. So I'm not saying I was th I'm this, uh, this Machiavellian as he is, but um, if you have any complaints about my talk, please call him or send him an email there. Uh, and I'm sure he'll get back to you, okay? All right, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, uh, we'll be here all day and tomorrow. And we have a booth over there with me in the costume if you want to come, come talk to us, okay? Thank you.